Okay, so here, uh, I mean, what we have here is the Taylor expansion of the natural logarithm um, in x equal 1. Yeah? I mean, you can see it here, x minus 1, x minus 1, all the time. That's why the expansion point is 1. And, yeah, the proof for this is actually not really difficult. Um, what we basically do is, or what we all the time have to do when we, when we uh, compute a Taylor series, First, we have to compute all the derivatives of the function. Huh? Okay, first derivative of the log, second derivative, third, fourth. And here, I mean, if you look at this, then you get an idea about how the formula for the nth derivative of the log looks like. And that's it. I don't want to talk too much about, the, about how we get this idea. You just look at this. Huh? Um, but be careful. I mean, here we have it up to the fourth derivative. This, of course, is no proof that this formula is true for the 576th derivative. Huh? So we have to prove it. And typically, I mean, this is a formula for the nth derivative, for n equal 1 to infinity. And such propositions typically are being proven by induction. Yeah. Okay, and here we have a nice induction proof. The, uh, in, in the induction proof, of course, we have to prove that the formula is true for n equal 1. And this obviously holds. And now we have to prove that the formula is true for n plus 1, given that it is already true for n. Okay. So now, um, the n plus first derivative of the log is nothing but the first derivative of the nth derivative. Huh? Um, and for the nth derivative, we are here allowed to use the formula from here. So now what we have to do is to compute the derivative of this formula. And now, um, all this is irrelevant. The only thing that's irrelevant is this. Huh? Yeah. And this is x to the power minus n. So the derivative gives us a factor minus n. Okay? So we get a factor minus 1 and a factor n. If we put this factor n together with this n minus 1 factorial, that gives us the n factorial, and the ma uh, this term times minus 1 gives this, and we are, we are ready. Okay, and now we use this formula um, and put it in here into our Taylor formula. Now, this is the Taylor formula with the case derivative of the logarithm, and if for this we use this formula, then that's what we get. And one very important thing which we do not prove here, but we have to do it all the time, is we have to show that our Taylor series converges to the function. Huh? Um, and here, the Taylor series converges only for all x between 0 and 2. And outside it does not converge. Yeah. And now uh, our expansion point is x equal 1, and it converges between 0 and 2. And that's why we uh, also say, for in this case, the Taylor series of the logarithm um, has a convergence radius of 1. Yeah? So it converges in a kind of a circle around 1 with radius 1. Uh, I mean, it's not really a circle, it's an interval. Yeah? 
so if we have the zero here and one here and two, then I mean we are just talking about this one-dimensional axis, huh? and uh, the question is what is a one-dimensional circle around this point with radius one? Yeah, it's this interval. This is the one-dimensional circle. Huh? Okay, yeah, here we have the definition of the uh, convergence area. The convergence area is just the interval in which it converges. And if this interval is symmetric, then we call this R the convergence radius. Okay, and here we have a, a nice example. So, yeah, let me shortly show you this example because this is also a typical example for an application of uh, the Taylor series. Do you remember the example we, are, we, we already had? We had already one nice application example. What was that? So let me remind you, here it is. No, where was it? Where is it? Um, no, here, this is it. The integral of a function which we cannot integrate. So we use the Taylor series and integrate it. Okay, and here we have an example where we deal with a function that is not so nice. And we want to replace it by a low order polynomial. And yeah, the, um, I mean, you all have heard or hopefully you know the uh, theory of relativity from Einstein. And um, the interesting thing is that this is a generalization of Newton's uh, theory of mechanics, of classical mechanics. Huh? And Einstein developed uh, relativistic mechanics. Um, and now here we can show that the, the classical formula that you know for the kinetic energy of a mass which is one half m v squared. This well-known formula is a special case of Einstein's formula in the limit for small velocities. Yeah? yeah, and I mean, that's nice to know that uh, Newton's theory is a special case of Einstein's theory for small velocities. Yeah? Okay, what do we know from Einstein? You, you all know this formula. Maybe you even have it printed on your T-shirt. And I mean, if you print a formula on your T-shirt, then after a few weeks, you really know it by heart and understand it. And so maybe you should print the whole script on, on your T-shirt. <laughs> But, I mean, there are some people who say that's even as good if you just put the script into your shelf and uh, it stands there for years and the longer it stands there, the better you know the contents of the script or book. But, uh, I mean, I would say this is a theory. Uh, I'm not sure whether it works in practice. Okay, so let's look at Einstein's theory. Um, this is the formula for the total energy of some object which has uh, the, the mass m. Huh? Okay, um, and also we have to know that um, the mass of some object increases if its kinetic energy increases. Huh? Uh, so, so this mass depends on the speed of the object. Huh? And therefore, the kinetic energy is this term, mc squared, minus 
m0 and m0 is the mass of the object at zero speed. So this is the formula for the kinetic energy and now of course we have to know a formula for, the, for how the mass depends on the speed and this is Einstein's uh, formula for the mass. You see if here we have m0 which is the mass for zero speed and then there is this term which includes this ratio V over C. C is the light speed and V is the actual speed of my object. And now what we want to know is, I mean we replace this in here yeah? and then we get for the kinetic energy this formula. And now we want to know how does this look like for V towards zero. Yeah? So the limit, we want to know kind of the limit for V towards zero of the kinetic energy. So um, yeah, let's <coughs> call this classical. This is for the classical limit but we want for the kinetic energy for this formula the limit V towards zero. Now look at this formula and uh, tell me the result. I mean we, we actually don't need a Taylor series. That's quite easy. What is the limit for V towards zero? Hmm? Who said zero? Somebody said zero. You? No? You. Yes, you're right. Perfect. I mean, it's as easy as it can be. If you put V equals zero here, then you get a one in the denominator. This is a one and this is zero and that's it. I mean, that's not surprising. <laughs> For zero speed, the kinetic energy is zero. Of course, that's, uh, um, that's not surprising at all. But unfortunately, from this, we don't get a formula for small uh, speed uh, v. Yeah? So now we have to develop this expression for, for small v. Yeah? And I mean that's, that's always what we do when we want to know um, a special case of a formula for small argument. We develop it in a Taylor series. Why? Because it's a power series and it starts with the, with the smallest power of x which is zero and then comes one and two and so on. Yeah? Um, and for um, for small arguments, we don't need all the terms. We just need the, the lower order terms. Yeah, and that's what we do. And uh, so now we look at this formula and we can replace uh, V over C by X. So we take 1 over square root of 1 minus X squared. That's the, form, that's the term we now want to develop into a Taylor series for small x. Yeah? So we take the leading terms uh, for x and neglect all the rest. Yeah? Okay, so I don't do all the details of the calculation. We develop this into a Taylor, so we can write it in this way. And this is the Taylor series we get. Um, and we actually only use the first two terms, the constant and the linear term. I mean, we cannot, if we uh, delete this term too, then we get what we had before, then we get zero. Huh? Uh, so we need to use the first term including our x, which is this one. Okay, so this is our approximation of that term and now if we replace this in our formula for the kinetic energy um, here, so we replace this by our formula 
then we get 1 plus 1 half v squared over c squared minus 1. You see this cancels out. Um, yeah, and then we multiply this in here, inside. Uh, so we, we multiply this with that. We get 1 half m0, and then the c squared cancels out, and half, 1 half m0 v squared. That's the leading term, and oh, and this is the term if we still use this here. Uh, but we can <coughs> neglect it because this goes with the fourth power of v, and therefore we can neglect it for small uh, v. Is it obvious that? I mean, why can we neglect? I mean, that's if I have something like f of x is equal to um, a two times x squared plus a four times x to the fourth power. Why can we neglect this term? I mean, typically. The, the fourth power of x is much bigger than the second. Why can we neglect this term? The decimal value increases like the digits after the decimal. The digits after the decimal increase. What does that mean? Like suppose if we have 0 0.1, 0.1 into 0 0.1 is 0 0.01. You mean the number of zeros behind the decimal point increase, yeah? Um, yes. I mean, that's one way to say it, but maybe it's possible even easier. I mean, if I take the fourth power of a very small number, it's much smaller than the second power, yeah? But uh, it's important. What is a very small number? Very small numbers are numbers that are much smaller than one. That's the important thing. Uh, everything bigger than one, then this is the dominant term. Everything much smaller than one, this is the dominant term. Okay, yeah, so much about Taylor series. Any questions? No questions? So you haven't done the exercises yet. You know what to do? Um, or the exercises are too easy. Huh? Okay, now let's go into analysis with many variables. Multidimensional analysis. We now consider functions from vectors of length n onto real numbers. So our function, you can see it here, has many arguments, but the return value has only one, uh, is only one number. Okay, yeah. So we are talking about the vector space uh, in n dimensions. You remember all this from the Strang lecture. Um, and yeah, we will use a norm. We need a norm, especially in high dimensional spaces, because uh, very often it is inconvenient if we have a, a 500 dimensional vector to look at all 500 components of the vector. Sometimes we want to know, is this a huge vector or is it a small vector? Is this vector uh, long or short or tiny? And that's why we use the norm for. A norm is a really convenient um, tool because it allows us to bring our 500 dimensional vector back onto one number. Uh, it computes one number out of an arbitrarily long vector. Uh, 
And that's nice. That's nice all the time. I mean, in everyday life, we always want to have one number. How much does it cost? 10,000 euros. And then you know everything. Huh? No, of course not. But, I mean, that's what, that's what we like to, uh, to have. You want to have a, uh, a label um, a quantity. Yeah. Okay. Um, and these are the properties of a norm. I don't repeat them. You just look at them. Any function that's a norm has to fulfill these three properties. And as a particular example, and very important example, we use the Euclidean norm, which is nothing but the Pythagoras formula applied to the components of our vector. Um, and this is the length uh, of the vector. But it's important to know that the Euclidean norm is not the only important norm in mathematics. We will, in the following, when we go into numerics, for example, use the maximum norm, which is quite different. Okay, and then we have this little theorem that um, the square of any vector, which is nothing but the scalar product of the vector with itself, is nothing but the square of the norm. Yeah. Or you could also say the norm of a vector is the square root of the square of the vector. Okay, and yes, and from this we see that the scalar product in our n-dimensional space uh, no, not includes, induces the Euclidean norm. So whenever you have a vector space with a scalar product, you can use this scalar product as a norm in, in that sense, such that you take the square root of the scalar product and that's your norm. Okay, yeah, now we look at uh, sequences and series in our vector space. And this definition is exactly the same as we had it in one dimension, with the only difference that here we have an n. Anything else is the same. Huh? So this is the definition of a vector sequence. And here we have an example of a vector sequence. So we take this vector, and then this, and this, and so on. Uh, towards infinity, and that's a vector sequence. And as you can see, this vector sequence is nothing but three sequences like this one, this one, and this one, <coughs> written above each other. So you can, uh, whenever we talk about a vector sequence, it is nothing but a vector of sequences. And everything you know from sequences also holds for vector sequences. But, I mean, yes, of course, we have to be careful, for example, when we look at the convergence of a vector sequence. If you look at this again, it's the, exactly the same we had before, just that we replace the real numbers by Rn by the vector space. And, of course, this here is not the absolute value of a real number, it is the norm of a vector. That's the only difference. And then, there is a nice little theorem that tells us a vector sequence converges if and only if all its coordinate sequences converge to the respective coordinates of the limit. Yeah, and the proof is uh, not difficult. You can do it as an exercise. Okay, and the notation, I mean, now we need 
for the, the elements of our vector sequence, for the components of the elements of our sequence, we need two indices. Yeah? The lower index is the component and the upper index is the, the index, uh, the number in, in the sequence. Okay, yeah. Now we talk about functions from an n-dimensional space onto an m-dimensional space. Um, this is nothing new for you. It is actually what you had all the time in linear algebra. How does such a function look like? a function from n-dimensional space into m-dimensional space in linear algebra. So maybe that's a new, um, a new view for you. Um, maybe you didn't look at this when you did linear algebra. But you are dealing all the time with functions from Rn onto Rm. Let's make an example. Let's say we, uh, we, uh, we are looking for a function f from R2 to R3. Yeah, then that's a matrix, of course. And it is a 3 by 2 matrix. This, for example, you multiply it with a vector of length 2 and you get uh, as a result a vector of length 3. So uh, 3 by 2 matrix is a function mapping from two-dimensional space onto three-dimensional space. Yeah, but, but this of course is not, not everything. There are other functions from two-dimensional space in three-dimensional space. Of course, you can replace these numbers by infinitely many others. But no, these guys here are the linear functions. Guess why it's called linear algebra? Huh? It's because of the matrix multiplication. Because this represents the class of linear functions. And now in analysis, we do not restrict ourselves to linear functions. We allow arbitrary functions. <coughs> and now maybe, I mean, we, we might ask, but why do we then need this linear algebra if we, if we can generalize it to arbitrary functions? So we just forget all of linear algebra and we, we do it much more sophisticated here. What's the reason why we need linear algebra anyway? The reason is that it's here in the nonlinear case, it immediately gets much more difficult and complicated. And in the linear case, it is so easy and nice. And, and that's the first reason for linear algebra. And the second reason is there are so extremely many applications of this linear stuff that we need an in-depth kind of an engineering theory. I mean, linear algebra is kind of the engineering of mathematics. That's the everyday tool we use all the time. Okay, so now let's go into the nonlinear functions. So look, we map a vector of length n onto a vector of length m. And this f here, is it a bold face f? It should be. How is it in the script? 
oh no, sorry. This is, you see, this is m equal 1. Yeah? So we are mapping onto from r n to r. Yeah? And therefore, this f is no vector. It's just one single value. And this is an example. Yeah? So this is a function of two arguments uh, with one return value. OK, and now we have m uh, greater than 1. And then you see we map this vector of length n onto a vector of length m yeah, with m components. And each one of these components is of the form f1 of x1 to xn, fm of x1 to xn. And now if you compare these components to what we had here, this is the same thing. Yeah? And that's very important because, I mean, this case m, e, uh, m not equal to 1 is more complex than m equal 1, of course. But it is actually not more difficult because we can always see such a function mapping onto a vector of length m as consisting of m independent functions mapping to the real numbers. That's very important uh, because this makes the whole thing easier. Huh? OK, yeah, look at this example. We map a vector of length two, uh, 3 onto a vector of length 2. And this is one function to the real numbers, and this is a second function. Okay. Yeah, a an, an, uh, practical example here, we can imagine, I mean, we might call this the weather forecast uh, formula. Huh? I mean, if you, if you really know this function, then you know how the weather is at any point on the whole globe. Huh? Um, because this is a function mapping two angles, theta and phi, onto the temperature at that point on the globe. I mean, we can, on, on the surface of the Earth, any point is uniquely described by two angles. Huh? So this is the temperature at that point, the air pressure, and the humidity. Yeah. OK, yeah, let's talk about contour plots and basic and easy tool. Um, yeah. Now, let's, let's start with a picture. This is, on the left, this is the graph, the contour plot of a function. And this function is, the formula for this function is f of x and y is equal to Oh, no, was it x1 and x2? Yeah. x1 and x2 is equal to x1 times x2, the product of these two arguments. Um, oh, let's start with this. I mean, this is a 3D plot of that function, and it looks like that. But, I mean, these, these 3D plots are nice, nice to watch, but it is hard to get numeric details out of such a plot. I mean, if I want to know the function value at this point, for example, what would that be? Uh, x2 equals 0 and x1 equals minus 1. What is the function value? That's, that's difficult. It's hard to know. Yeah? But it's much, uh, I mean, it's much easier in such a contour plot. And uh, these lines here are the contours. And what is a contour? A contour is a line um, where the function value is constant. Huh? So the contour line to the function value c, that's what we get from solving this equation. OK? Now, yeah, it is actually the, the curve of points and in two-dimensional space, 
with this equation. And maybe you don't have an intuition about how this looks like, but maybe it helps you if you solve it for x2, which is equal to c divided by x1. Huh? And now you see x2 depends on x1 in this way. Huh? And this is a, a hyperbola. Um, and that's what we see here. All these curves. You get this hyperbolic uh, shape of the contour lines. I mean, I have done this with Mathematica, and the command is contour plot uh, of the function, and then the x interval, the y interval, and then there are some options. Um, yeah. But you should also be able to compute your contour lines manually, and that's the way how to do it. Okay, yeah, let's talk about continuity in Rn. And again, we do have the same definitions. So it, everything generalizes onto uh, more than one dimensions. And now you see, you really should know the one dimensional analysis by heart now, because everything we do in multi-dimensional analysis is based on one-dimensional analysis. So, yeah, we talk about, about convergence of sequences in Rn with the same expressions as we did it in one dimension. Um, yeah. So this is the definition of a function converging to C for x towards A. And now, when, once we have this notion, we can define what continuity means, the same as we had before in one dimension. Okay, yes, and from these definitions, one can uh, immediately prove that um, if we have two continuous functions, f and g, then the sum of these two is continuous, the difference of these two is continuous, the product is continuous, continuous, and the ratio is continuous. But with the ratio, we have to be careful. Look, here we don't have a bold phase h. Why? In the denominator. This h is not bold phase. What does that mean? What does bold phase mean? Huh? Function? No. Bold phase means vector. The bold phase x is a vector. Bold phase h would be a vector. But here we cannot use a vector. Why? Have you ever divided anything by a vector? No. I don't know either how to divide by a vector. So just, just because we don't know how to divide by vectors, we don't do it. OK, differentiation of functions in Rn. I mean, now we have n variables, so we can choose whether to um, differentiate our function by x1, x2, x3, and so on. And that's what partial derivatives is all about. So we take the derivative of f with respect to x1. And very important, while we do this, we keep all, variab all other variables as constant. Yeah? So we, we treat all, all other variables here, x2, as constant. Uh, constant means x2 does not depend on x1. That's important. And this is the notion 
for the partial derivative. And this, this is an alternative uh, notion. Yeah. And if we take this function 2x1 squared uh, x2 to the third power, then uh, the derivative with respect to x1 is this. With respect to x2, we get this. Okay, so we have two first derivatives huh? for a, a, a function with two arguments. Um, oh yes, and uh, um, look here, at the moment we only consider functions from n dimensions to one dimension. Yeah, and we have two first derivatives and now, since we have two first derivatives, we have four second derivatives. Why? Because we can take the derivative of this, of this first derivative, with respect to x1 and x2. And here also. So from these four, two first derivatives, we get four second derivatives. For example, this one. We can first take it uh, with respect to x1 and then to x2 and that's what we get. But we can do it in the, in the other uh, order too. Oh, and look, we get the same result. Isn't that nice? And this is a general truth. This is true all the time. So the mixed second derivatives, they do not depend on the order. Yeah. Okay, here we have another example. A function depending on three variables, u, v, and w. And then we take the first derivatives with respect to u and v, which are these. And uh, to w, we get this. Yeah. Um, and here we have a, a little definition. Um, and we talk now, look, we talk ab now about functions which are vector valued. A function that has m components. So this is a function from Rn to Rm. Here you see, to Rm. m components in the result and n components in the argument. And now if we look at such a function, then we can even take, uh, can take even more derivatives. We can take the first derivative of the first component with respect to all our variables. And we can take the first derivative of the second component with respect to all variables. And that's what we have here in the Jacobian matrix. F1 derived with respect to X1. F1 to X2, F2 to X1. And we get a whole matrix only of first derivatives. Huh? So, but, I mean, you have to be careful. You have to be careful. Here we get a matrix of only first derivatives. Huh? If we go back here, if we consider only functions with, with one component, then the, the vector consisting of all partial derivatives is only a vector, but not a matrix. Okay, yes. Um, linearization of a function, or let's say linear approximation of a function. And this is actually the, the connection to linear algebra. But now we first do it in one dimension. 
I mean, this is old stuff, but it's the good thing, it's easy, and you, you know it all. We have this function here. And now we want to do a linear approximation. I mean, we could, we could develop it, uh, we could expand it into a Taylor series, and then take the term of first order, and if we do it at this point x0, we would get this uh, straight line, which is the tangent in this point. But we don't need to develop it into a Taylor series because it's easy. Um, the formula for this tangent is this, f of x0 plus f prime of x0 times x minus x0. I mean, that's easy. We take f of x0. Now, that's, that's this value, f of x0. And now, the slope of this line here is the first derivative of the function at this point. So we get f prime of x0, this is the slope, times the distance we walk here, and this is x minus x0. So this is the formula for the tangent, okay, in one dimension. So that shouldn't be new for you now. Okay, so we just remember this formula for the tangent in one dimension. And now we do the generalization. We apply this formula for the tangent in one dimension to m-dimensional analysis. Huh? Um, yes. Or maybe we should write it on the blackboard such that we can now then use it. Um, let's call it um, T of X. The tangent is equal to F of X0 plus F prime of X0 times X minus X0. Okay, we remember this. And now we apply the same thing in more dimensions. We define a function g of x1 and x2, so, uh, in two, uh, so just in two dimensions, which is equal, oh yes, and we want to linearize our function f in some point x0 equal pi 0. And which was our function f? Yeah, this is our function f. Okay? Yeah, we look at this function which has three components. And now we compute this Jacobian matrix. So this here is F, the, the first derivative of F1 with respect to X1. And you see this is zero. The first derivative of um, X1 with respect to, X, uh, of F1 with respect to X2 is two. First derivative of F2 with respect to X1 is the cosine of this, and so on. So this is our Jacobian matrix. And now, we just use, I mean, one has to prove that this is true and derive it, but it is true. We use this one-dimensional formula for the multidimensional case. No? So we take, look, we take f of x0. So we just replace uh, x1 and x2 by our two components, which are pi and 0. No? And that's what we get. This is f of x0 plus the first derivative at the point x0. So we take our Jacobian matrix, this one, and replace x1 by pi and x2 by 0. And then 
we get this matrix times x minus x0. So, and this, this here is x1 minus pi and x2 minus 0. Okay, and now you see what we get. We get a vector plus matrix times vector. And now we can, we can perform this matrix multiplication and also uh, calculate the sum here and that's what we get. And what do we have here? What is this? I mean, these are just three linear functions. Three linear functions. They are all linear in x1 and x2. So that's the linearization of this function. Yeah? And look, we had a function from R2 to R3. And that's why we have here a 3 by 2 matrix. Oh yes, let me mention one thing. I mean, we call this function G the, the linearization of F. And now it gets confusing. Now I tell you that G is not a linear function. Why is G not linear? Did we define in this lecture already what linearity means? Oh yes, we did. I remember I did it here on the board uh, somewhere after the first strang lecture or maybe after the second. Do you remember what uh, what linearity means? What is a linear function? And I also remember at that time I told you you never forget this. Huh? Yeah, because it's important. I mean, at some point, at least when you get your master degree, you should know what linear means. Don't you agree? Okay, I mean, it's not too late. You don't have your master yet. Huh? This is property number one of a linear function and this is property number two for any real number alpha. Huh? Okay, and I guess we also looked in the one-dimensional case at functions which are nonlinear. As an example, f of x is equal to 3x plus 1. This is a nonlinear function. Why? Because of the plus 1 here. This equation does not hold. Look. Look at the left hand side. f of x plus y is equal to um, 3 times x plus y plus 1, which is 3x plus 3y plus 1. Now, what is this here? Uh, sorry. 3x plus 3y plus 2. Here we have the difference. So left hand side and right hand side are not equal and that's why this function is nonlinear. What do we need to do to make it linear? We just have to take 0 here and everything is okay. 
you see, as soon as you add a constant to a linear function, it's no longer linear. I'm sorry for that, but that's the truth. And many people call such functions linear, uh, so they are, they're all lying. Huh? And that's why this function here is nonlinear. Because here we have the linear algebra. But we add something. And I mean, you can, of course, also see it here in the third component. Linear, linear, nonlinear, nonlinear. Okay. Next example, let's look at this function here. f of x and y is equal to this term for x and y not equal to zero. And of course, for x and y equals zero, the denominator is not defined. Uh, sorry, the function is not defined. And now we define it as zero in the origin. And now, um, how can we prove that this function is differentiable? I mean, if for, for, the, for a moment we exclude the origin, then it's easy. Because then we can argue this function is built up of differentiable functions. Here, x is differentiable, y is differentiable, the product of differentiable functions is differentiable. Uh, the denominator, let's look at this. This is differentiable, this is differentiable. Square root is differentiable, uh, except the origin. Uh, so the whole denominator is differentiable, except in the origin. And then uh, we have the ratio of two differentiable functions. So the whole function is differentiable. So you see, uh, in many, many cases, it's very easy to prove that a function is differentiable uh, by using these rules. You don't really go back to the uh, definition. OK, yeah. Um, Uh, yes, uh, okay, and now, I mean, now we look at the origin. We look closer into the origin. Uh, yeah. Okay. Here, yeah. It's not linear. Uh-huh. And uh, why do we call this process linearization? <laughs> <laughs> yes, that's a good question. Yeah, but I can give you an answer. Um, we, call, we call this process, let's look at the one-dimensional case because there it's easier to see. Um, let's take the exponential function. e to the power x is 1 plus x plus x squared divided by 2 factorial plus x third power divided by 3 factorial plus and so on. Okay? Now, I ask you, which one among these infinitely many terms is the linear term? Yeah, this one, x. Not the one. This is the linear term. The second term is the linear term, except the one. Yeah? Just this is the linear term. And now, if we omit everything which is after the linear term, then we call this process linearization, because the linear term is the highest order term. Yeah? But that does not mean the resulting function is linear. Sorry for this confusion, but uh, this is historic. Okay. 
Okay, so now, now we prove that this function in the origin is not differentiable. Um, I mean, yeah, but where did, we, did, did we define differentiability? Uh, no. Oh, sorry. Okay, yes, I forgot to include a definition here. Um, hmm. So, the definition of differentiability of um, functions from many variables is the following. First, all partial, uh, partial derivatives has to, uh, have to exist, and second, they all have to be continuous. Yeah, that's important. And what does it mean for a partial derivative to be continuous? I mean, the partial derivative is just a function. Huh? And this function has to be continuous. Huh? Um, so, for example, there may be no steps uh, in, in this um, partial derivative. And now we will show that the partial derivative of f with respect to x is not continuous. Huh? So we have a jump in the partial derivative of f with respect to x. Now, um, so we are talking about this function here, and we, t we compute the partial derivative with respect to x, which is this. So we, uh, we use the the ratio rule for, for the derivatives, and then we get these two terms. Um, yeah, and now we show that this function is not continuous. So this function is not continuous. And what we do is, we look at this function for x equals zero. So in our two-dimensional space, x and y for x equals 0. So on the y-axis, along the y-axis, we now look at this function. Yeah? So this first derivative for x equals, so we put x equals 0. So we get a 0 here, so we get y over y, which is 1, and x equals 0 gives a 0 here. So we get this value is equal to 1. So on the y-axis, our first derivative everywhere has the value 1, especially here. And now we do the, th the same thing and look at it on the x-axis. So we said y equals 0. y equals 0 gives us a 0 here and a 0 here, and we get 0. And now you see what happens. This is kind of like a bridge, but this is actually the, I mean, Something like that. <laughs> uh, I mean, here we have the level 1 on, on the y-axis, and here we have the level 0 on the x-axis. Um, and this is enough to prove that our function is not differentiable in the origin. Um, yeah. we, don't, we don't have to look into the origin. Because what is the limit of this first derivative if I approach the origin on this axis here? The limit is 1. What is the limit if I approach the origin from here? It is 0. Okay, so now we have two sequences approaching the origin with different limits, and that's the definition of discontinuity. Yeah? So this function is discontinuous in the origin. 
And it is actually not important on which path I approach the origin. I might do it like that. It's okay too. If I find two different limits, the function is discontinuous. Okay, so f is in the origin not differentiable. And I mean, this is a defect of the function which we cannot correct. No matter, I mean, we might try to define our first derivative in the origin somehow, but it doesn't matter how I, how, how I would define. The problem with these two limits still exists. They are not the same. Okay, and then we can talk about symmetries. Let's look at this first symmetry. F is symmetric with respect to exchange of x and y. So if we exchange x and y, so it is symmetric with respect to not this line, but this plane here. Uh, the plane x equal y. And so on. I just omit this due to time reasons. Okay, and the, comp the, the contours of the function can be computed. Um, yeah, okay, I, I'm, uh, I will uh, omit this too. Um, and it looks like this. Yeah, maybe we, we just look at this picture. Because if we look at this picture, we really get the intuition this function is not differentiable in the origin. That's the point. I mean, this is like a sheet of paper. Do I have a sheet of paper? Yeah. And now, this is like, can we do it with a sheet of paper? Hmm. Yeah, something like that. Such a such a bend like like this. Yeah. Something like that. And what we did before was we looked at the partial derivative with respect to x. So this is uh, no, I don't know. This, let's suppose this is the x-axis. And then we took the partial derivative with respect to x on this line here, which is 0. Was it that or was it 1? 0. Okay, yeah, then that's correct. Look, we, we really uh, walk on one contour line. And now we take the partial derivative with respect to x on this line here. And if you look at this point, if you are on this line and, and we, we walk into this direction, it goes uphill here. Yeah? So this partial derivative was 1. Okay, yeah. Yeah, let's continue. We define the gradient. The gradient is nothing new. It is just the vector consisting of all partial first derivatives. So if we take all first partial derivatives, we get the gradient. And what's very important about the gradient is that it points into the direction of the steepest ascent of our function f. So the gradient always tells us if we want to climb up a mountain, which is the shortest way up to the top of the mountain. Huh? Or the negative gradient, which is the opposite direction, tells us 
the direction of the steepest descent. Okay, here we have an example. We take this function f of x and y, x squared plus, I, uh, plus y squared. Um, we immediately see that the contour lines of this function are circles. Why? x squared plus y squared is equal to some contour value c. You see, this is the equation for a circle. Huh? So the contour lines are circles like that. And the farther we get away from the origin, the higher up it goes. Huh? So it's uh, uh, like a parabolic bowl, the, the graph of this function. So the direction of the steepest ascent is it's just radially out of the origin. Or if I'm here, the gradient shows points in this direction. And we can compute it. The first derivative uh, to x is 2x. And uh, with respect to y, it's 2y. So the gradient is this. Yeah. And you see it radially points outwards. OK, higher partial derivatives. We have already seen in one example that the second partial derivatives, they are symmetric. Yeah? And that's what we see in this theorem. This theorem says, in general, that the second partial derivatives um, are symmetric. So we can, we can switch i and j here. Yeah. Okay, and this can, I mean, of course, if this holds for second partial derivatives, then from this immediately follows that it is true for higher partial derivatives too. Because I can take a first partial derivative as a, of a function and define it as a new function and then take the second partial derivatives. These are then the third partial derivatives of the original function. And then it holds for third partial derivatives and so on. Yeah? And therefore, um, it is true that, I mean, if I take the kth partial derivative of some function f with respect to x i k, x i k minus 1, and so on, up to x i 1, um, then this is the same as if I did these partial derivatives in a different order. So I use a permutation of these indices 1 up to k, so it does not matter in which order I do the partial derivatives. Okay, so this laptop has a power problem, but it has to make it for 15 more minutes. Let's see. Oh, yeah, that's no problem, 25%. Okay, now we define the, to the total differential. The total differential of a function f. We already talked about linearization of a function. The linearization of a function was, oh, uh, let's hope we still have it on the board. Yes. This is the tangent in one dimension. f of x0 plus f prime of x0 times x minus x0. And look. That's exactly what we have here. We just have to bring this f of x0 to the right hand side, and then that's it. OK? So that's, that's the formula for the tension. And you see, ft, that's what we call the ta tangential mapping, ft of x. Um, oh, 
obvious, but but this is this is a, uh, an error here. This must be x. Yes. Could I e of f in the neighborhood of x zero? Yes. So this is this is not correct. This must be an x, not x zero. So we want to do an approximation of our function f around our expansion point x0, close to x0. Huh? Or yeah, at the moment, let's say very close to x0. Huh? So that means our x here, this is not a 0, yeah? our x is very close to x0. And then we call this difference, this tiny difference, df of x. Yeah. This df of x is the, the difference between our uh, tangent mapping minus the original function. So let's, let's look at the one-dimensional picture. x0, and now suppose we have this function and the tangent. And now we take an x close to x0, and then we have, this is f of x0, and this is f tangent of x. Uh, sorry, not of x, zero, of x. Yeah. So we are looking at this small, oops, oh, sorry. At this small difference here. You see, the difference between the tangent and the, or the uh, f of x0, yeah. f tangent of x minus Okay, yeah, and now we define our dx. Look, dx is this here. This is x minus x0. Yeah? x minus x0 is our vector dx, and it consists of all these components, dx1 through dxn. And um, we want to know what happens with our function if we do make a small, um, a small shift in x 
how does this result in the function value? Yeah. Oh, maybe I have to draw a new picture here. <coughs> I mean, the point is we do it all in multi-dimensions and now it's getting hard to draw multi-dimensional pictures. So I only can draw a one-dimensional picture. X, and now we have X0 and X. And there is our function. We have this little difference dx and now we have this little difference in the function value f of x0 f of x yeah? and that's what we so this difference is what we call df of x So if I make a small shift in x, what does that mean in terms of a change in our function value? And now we cannot, very often we have no idea what that is. And therefore we do an approximation. We put the tangent here. And the tangent is a linear mapping. So we just l apply this linear, oh, be careful, the tangent is not a linear mapping. It's a linearization of our function. And you know what's the difference between linear mapping and linearization? The linearization is allowed to have a constant term. Huh? And I mean, because the tangent does not need to hit the origin, uh, it's not a linear function. So we use this linearization of f in order to get this here. And as you can see, we just have to multiply our, our dx. This is, yeah, let's say colors. So this green guy here is our dx. And that's what we have here, dx. And... Uh, Yeah, it's good to see that actually our df is this red thing here. Yeah? <coughs> but what we get if we use the linearization is is this. Yeah? And they are not, typically they are not equal. But if we make this dx extremely small, then these two guys get closer and closer to each other. Yeah? So for, for very small dx, using this tangent here is an approximation for our df for the change in the function value. Okay, yeah, and what, what do we have here? Look, look at this formula. This formula tells us exactly what we do. We take our dx, multiply it linearly. This is really linear here because there is no constant term by f prime of x0 and then we get this df of x. Yeah? dx times the slope of this tangent gives us this yellow guy here. Oh yes, unfortunately I did, sorry. The definition over there, the df we have over there, is, is really the, what we get from the linear mapping. Yeah? So um, 
we have to call the yellow thing df and the red thing let's call it let's call it delta f This is the delta. Okay. Okay, and that's what we call the total differential. No, no. Let's let's start here. So this is look. This is the vector of all first der partial derivatives times the vector dx. This is oh, this is a scalar product. And the scalar product is nothing but this, the sum over all k df uh, derived by xk times dxk. And the sum over all this, this is what we get. And that's what we call the total differential. And the total differential is quite important in engineering because I mean, suppose you do some measurements of some variables x1 through xn and all these measurements have a little error and then you compute a function from these measurements and you want to know how does this, how do these measurement errors transform <laughs> onto my result and then you need to know all the partial derivatives and you can get an estimate of the error in your results. It's only an estimate. It's only an estimate because of this approximate here. I mean, yeah, you, you see it in this picture because these two are not uh, identical. Okay, yeah, so this is the total differential. Yeah, okay. Um, and we have this approximate, uh, no, let's say, if I'm close enough to my point x0, to the expansion point x0, uh, then this total differential is a good approximation uh, because our function is partially differentiable. And partially differentiable means that the first derivatives are continuous. Okay, yeah, okay, and as an application of this, um, we can use the law of error propagation. Yeah, let's see, um, shall we first look at the example? Yes, why don't we first look at the example? Um, or should we stop here? Yeah, let's stop. <coughs>